Pen and a Bible, exploring the Sunday scriptures. Join Father Panagiotis Bosnos, Father Nick Leonis, and Stephen Christoforou for their weekly Orthodox Christian Bible study. They are three friends who hang out every week and explore the Sunday Gospel and Epistle readings. The pros. Yeah. Simeon watches oh, I... every Sunday with my dad, but that's... Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Is he still a Lions fan? <laughs> Simeon? Uh, no, he's a huge... <laughs> Unfortunately, he's a huge Tom Brady fan. Ooh. Well, he's done. Done move on. Yeah, I know. It's hard not to be, unless you're into Michigan State and you hate everything Michigan, and thus you don't like Tom Brady. Hmm. Overrated. Can you say overrated? Guys, you totally hate everything overrated. Michigan? Not my wife. No. <laughs> she went to Michigan. Um, no, actually, Michigan medicine is really helpful. So... Michigan medicine is that some sort of like alternative medicine? Uh, it is. It is where my son goes for all his cystic fibrosis stuff. Oh, it's a place. Yeah, I thought it's like well, you know how people talk about like hospital, Eastern but... medicine or New Age medicine. I thought Michigan medicine. Oh, yeah. oh. it's not a descriptor. No. What would Michigan medicine be? A lake? Just go. Just go dip yourself in in Lake Michigan. For everything. A towel that's off a, with a Detroit pan pizza. Yeah, that's right. I had Jets that's for the first time this this week. I wasn't a fan. Uh, that's all right. No. All our, right. Wait, how, our, how? How did you have it? Did you have it in Chicago? Uh, we were having Goya, you know. Youth, that's, that's all right. Classic youth group. Just, I don't like, I don't, I don't love Detroit style pizza. It's because it's not even it's, a style. It's all right. Uh, it's just, I mean, it is, but it's, I like regular pizza. Like just not, not your <laughs> right. not your New like, York, not your New York with like pe- with with pepperoni on it. Right, because that's regular. We're pizza. not really letting regular this. slice. Did we yeah, do this like, on air? But, Have we done this probably. on air? But I don't like the 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 thin the thin stuff that like when you pick it up you've just like sandpapered your hand because it's like mm. sandpaper on the bottom. I don't like that. I don't mind it. It's not my favorite. But do you do you put like cornmeal on the, the bottom right of your for, pizza or crushed you gravel? Be in the right mood for Chicago. Gotta be right. I mean, and, like you gotta right. Although, the reality is, Chicago style pizza. What is was more often consumed in Chicago is thin pizza, cut into squares, like a round pizza. I would probably like that. I probably like cut New York into style cut, pizza if it was cut on, yeah. on a grid pattern. That's like that's what <laughs> it is. That is kind of it is kind of that is the standard. I mean, like. If you're not getting deep dish, would you have to be in the mood for deep dish? If you're getting a normal mm-hmm. pizza in Chicago and it's not like some national chain, like, you know, a Papa John's or something like that. Like if you're just getting a local pizza, it's going to be a flat pizza, a thin pizza. Like a like New York thin? No, a little bit thicker, but not much. Cause, but, cause but the thing well, is, your your rectangles are so small. You're, you're not getting a big, you're not getting a big, you know, it's not a ray. There's no, know, like there's a, no, cr- it's not a crust. On what's, it called, what's it called? A cord? It's called a cord in, in geometry, right? A line segment. No, but like of a, of a pie, that would be a chord. Oh, an arc, right? I think it's a chord. Is it a chord? I'm okay. just gonna keep saying chord until somebody oh. is it a jackal? Jackal? Are we all <laughs> small amount of peas? Um, Someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not. We need a Tony Reale here sitting <laughs> off to the side correcting us when we're when we're wrong. Um, or just yeah, muting anyway. us when we're stupid. <laughs> I, my my the amount of time that I'd last on the show would be like, and it's been 15 minutes, and Father Nick's still here. It's a record. <laughs> but, Father Nick, we're gonna mute you so you can try and figure out what question you want to ask, and then <laughs> uh, when- <laughs> uh, uh, uh. we'll hear from you in 60 seconds. Beep. That's right. I have to like jot down my question. All questions must be submitted in writing. Thank you. Oh, so um, I don't know what else? What else? Pizza. I could talk about pizza all day. The best pizza in the world is in Rochester Hills, Michigan, but um, it's true. Whoa, whoa, whoa! It's true. It's, true. it's okay. It's known. It's known fact for anyone who's ever had it. You've had it. It was tasty. It was good. You just you just don't want to. It's fine. I get it. It was. It was, it was really real good. good. It was really good. It was amazing. Was it the best pizza I've ever had? Was this the time? Was this the time when Steve was visiting you? 
<laughs> and you were there too. Was I? No. The pizza but time? Was it the, fir- was it, was it the first time or the second time? First I ordination or twice. second ordination? I know, you were there for both times. It was one of the ordinations you, at, yeah. after my, at my house. And I stayed with you twice. Yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> I wasn't invited to stay anywhere when I went to Chicago, when I go to Chicago. Yeah. I, wasn't invited. I think when you have like Kubati, it's just so it's just automatically assumed that you would stay with. I am, I am in fact staying with Kubati. This is when some behind the scenes drama for, for the whole world. <laughs> All right, um, what's going on? Well, let's start. Should we start with prayer in the mix? And we want to talk about what's happening here in the world of orthodoxy on this Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open our eyes to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual way of life, both thinking and doing those things that are pleasing to you. Through you, Christ our God, the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we send up glory, together with your beginningless Father, your all holy, good, and life creating spirit, now and forever, into the age of ages. Amen. Amen. All right. What are we going to begin? This allusion to something on Sunday. What's 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 happening on Sunday? It is it is time. We enter Lord to act. Always. It's we are entering the trio the own trio the own. It's yes. a big deal. We're Can we talk about this like last the, time. Do we give a? Do we give a? They go on my my rant about what the trio the own is. I'm sure I have. Your rants are always welcome. On three minutes. All right. Bible, so. Let me. Uh, <laughs> good, good, thing I'm already sit- good thing I'm already sitting. Go ahead. <laughs> Have we not? We I can't not recall. Not? I'd say go for it. Just go for it. If you start, we'll we'll cut you off at some point. Oh well, fine. I'll just ask Father Nick what is the trio the one. No, let's hear your rant. Since you don't want to hear from me, I do want to hear it. I keep telling you, no, just, no, just go. I don't want to say. All right then. All I know is I'm not eating. Uh, next week, I'm eating meat on Wednesday. And I'm pretty excited about it. Friday, too. That's luxurious. That is. It's luxurious. Mm-hmm. Go. Just tell us. Tell us what you want to say. Relax. Relax. I'm getting there. Why are you so upset? Taking, you're, you're taking the scenic route, man. Listen, <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing a really bad job of compartmentalizing personal stuff and podcast <laughs> stuff. Okay. I'm fine. <laughs> So, the Triodion is a book. It is not a period of time. Kind of also a period of time, but also primarily a book. And the period of time gets its name from the book. The book. Which we say the Triodion opens now. Or during Vespers. Uh, so. Yeah. so, is it kind of like doing the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs? Sure. Not quite a period of time? Right. Okay. Um, so the Triodion is a, is a liturgical book that has within it the hymns that are chanted during this period. It's called the Triodion because <clears throat> in the Orthros of the Matins uh, canon, there are, there are nine odes, nine biblical odes, right? Nine biblical hymns that are modeled within uh, the canons. And um, the, this period only uses three of them. Instead of the nine, we typically only use eight. We never really use O2. It's whatever. Um, but the point is the structure of matins for this time period uses three odes instead of the standard eight or full nine. Um, and so this book is called the Triodion to identify that aspect of it. And it contains the hymns that are used from um, this coming Sunday, the, the public and, and or yeah, yeah, public and Pharisee through uh, through the end of Holy Week, and then we open the Pentecost Stadion, which is the period of book the book for the period of Pascha and uh, Pentecost. Um, typically, and you know, there's we we can get confused a little bit about this period as if uh, it's just those three weeks leading up to the beginning of Lent, because the Triodion mm-hmm. starts the hymns start three weeks prior to the actual official beginning of Lent with clean Monday. 
So people see the prefix tria, tris, at the beginning of it and assume that it refers to the three weeks leading into uh, Lent, but it actually refers to the entire period that we're using this, this book. So the Triodion period is not synonymous with Lent because it begins three weeks earlier, but also it's not those three weeks that lead into Lent itself. It's the full period. The full book, I dig. The full book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I am gonna call that a rant. More like a lecture. A clarification. Okay. Clarification. Thank you. And and so we'll, we'll see, right, that these are the same gospel, gospel and epistle readings <clears throat> for this for this uh, entire period, basically year to year. Um, yes. With one possible exception, like I think, I think the only the only thing that would trump it is an, is when Annunciation falls on a yeah on a Sunday. Should, it, should it fall on a Sunday? Yeah, which happened mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. But I think mm-hmm. otherwise, like you're going to get the same the same. You know, it's, it's the Sunday of the Publican and the Pharisee. You get that gospel reading. You get the accompanying epistle, which we're going to talk about all the way through. Yeah. So in the past, we've talked about the the cycle of uh, like the calendar. So the the saints, uh, the particular saints and feast days trumping the weekly cycle you're right so the the number of weeks from pot from pasca helps determine the the readings of the epistles but when there is a major saint that saint trumps at this point we are we are settled firmly within from this point through um through pentecost essentially we are firmly settled in these epistle readings and these gospel readings are standard and they they move around the calendar um, depending on the date of Pascha, but they will always be together um, and they will be in sequence. Yeah. So we're talking about this. We haven't yet read our epistle reading, so we should probably do that. Context. No, it's it's context. helpful. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's good. So I shouldn't. But what is, what, what is today's reading? What you're telling me is don't read these. Mm. Some point, Father Nick. Father Nick has very little patience for me today. <laughs> it's not true. Yeah. Y'all are sassy today. A little bit. <laughs> well, the apostolic reading for the publican and the Pharisee is from Saint Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is Second uh, Timothy three verses ten through fifteen. It begins, Timothy, my son. You have, observed, you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, my sufferings, what befell me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we've talked a little bit in the past about these letters to Timothy. Right. These are these are um, individuated letters to Timothy, who was uh, a bishop and Paul offering um, advice, like particularly for him. And this is more um, a a fragment of some of that advice, um, um, which emerges out of that relationship. And this is uh, Second Timothy is probably one of the last letters that Paul um, Paul writes. He writes it during his time in Rome. Um, He talks about his trial um, at other points in the letter. and he's, it's very obvious to him that uh, this is this is the beginning of uh, his martyrdom. Well, not the beginning of his martyrdom, but um, the completion, the perfection of his martyrdom uh, in Rome. And at another point, a little bit after this, he invites uh, he invites Timothy to come and join him. And uh, so it's not like a it's not like a farewell letter. It doesn't have that same sense like uh, some of the other um, experiences or some of the other letters that we've talked about before. Um, this is, you know, he's, he's speaking to Timothy, but the sense of persecution is very raw and very real because St. Paul is, you know, under house arrest at this time. Um, and at this point he's been, you know, he's lost support. Um, he says at another point in, in this letter that only Luke has stood with him. 
So he's inviting, uh, he's inviting Timothy and I believe Mark as well uh, to come be with him. He wants to be with those closest, um, his closest followers because he feels um, that others have uh, betrayed him or left him. Uh, and so much of, much of this discussion of persecution is based on what he's experiencing uh, at this point. And um, that uh, criticism of others is um, a, a very large part of this letter where he'll talk about you know, false teachers and uh, people who have uh, abandoned the truth of the gospel for whatever, whatever reason. Hmm. Mm -hmm. false teachers stuff that paul bumps into a, a bunch in a variety of contexts mm -hmm. so one of the things i want to point out early um is this this part where you where he says to timothy he says uh, my son you have observed my teachings my conduct and, and all these other things um that observed is is the new king james or it's the rsv translation um, the King James or New King James has a has a slightly different um, translation, but it it um, it comes from um, para colutho and um, akolutho or ak akolutheo means to follow, and para is along is alongside. Um, so sometimes it can mean understand, it can mean perceive, right? To follow follow along with conversation is to understand the con like. Are you following me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, so it could be that that sense of like you've observed these these things, um, but it could also mean very seriously to follow alongside, to to attend or be with someone. Um, and Timothy is from uh, is from Lystra, and so these and these areas when he's talking about Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, these are all places that are relatively close to each other, and they're all places that Paul has experienced particular uh, particular suffering. Uh, this Antioch, we should be clear, is uh, Pisidian and Antioch. So there's many different Antiochs. There's a lot of Antiochs. There's a lot of Antiochs, just like there's a lot of Alexandrias. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't know that? Mm -mm. Yeah. Did not know that. The Antioch uh, I always think of is, is the one in modern in Syria, Illinois. Right? Yeah, right. In Illinois, right? <laughs> yeah. There's an Antioch in Illinois, just like Paris, Texas. I, be I believe you. Mm -hmm. We also have a Harvard in Illinois as well. Not the same. <laughs> telling people you went to school at harvard not even harvard is in harvard true well that's harvard's not a place yeah um anyway yeah so it's it's pisidian it's called pisidian antioch um i guess that's what that's what you get to do like when you're alexander the great or one of his generals you just go around naming all these cities after yourself so antiochus antiochus the um did the same uh yeah. anyway not to be confused point, with pro OKS and the bad right. joke. no that Keep didn't going. work no um so when he's saying you've observed these things or you follow it along or you've attended he means he could mean quite literally right that you've seen these things with your own eyes you're a, a disciple of mine um and i worked with you in these in these areas you're from these lands and you have seen with your own eyes, not only my conduct, my aim, my faith, my patience, my preaching, right? Like not only have you seen the, the fruits of my labors and the, the extent that I would go to bring people the gospel, but you've also seen my persecutions and my sufferings, right? And then he's specific, like what happened to me in Antioch, he was thrown out, he was driven out of the city. At Iconium and Lystra, I think he was like, they attempted to stone him. Um, in Iconium and Lystra, they they did stone him and they left him outside the city for dead. They just, you know, um, and these are things that uh, Timothy observed. So, um, but as he lists them, right, he he ties them he ties them together, right, in this, this opening list. You've observed or you've witnessed both my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. These are all things that are, you know, blessed virtues and uh things to be emulated and so saint paul is saying you've you've witnessed all of these things and then he adds on not as an afterthought but as one continuous thought also my persecutions my sufferings and these specific things that you saw with your own eyes right and makes it very very clear that what he says just one sentence later all who desire to live a godly life in christ jesus will be persecuted um, 
reminding Timothy that this is this is what you've seen. This is what you know um, from your experience, right? These are not theoretical. Um, this is not a theoretical knowledge of Paul of St. Paul and not a theoretical knowledge of his suffering. This is this is eyewitness. When he's appealing to, to Timothy, he's telling yeah. him essentially, you will, you will, should you in fact emulate my conduct and my aim in life, that you will suffer the same. Yeah. Do you ever find and it? He's not doing uh, it to be like, you know, putting him putting him down or scare him, right? It's not like a, it's not like a you know, well, if you want to do this, this is what's going to happen. It was just, it's, it seems very, very much about like, this is just what it is. This is what life, this is what a godly life is. It is persecution. Right. Do you ever, so here he is showing like, you've observed these good things that I've done. Right. Mm -hmm. The first part of this, do you ever find yourself, I guess, and this is a specific letter to Timothy. But it seems like there's a fine line between boasting and showing yourself as an example. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think it's easy to, easier to show yourself as, as an example when you have a relationship with somebody that you are mentoring. Right. And that's what he's doing, what he's done. And just being like, I've done all these things and check me out, which is obviously not what he's doing. But I don't know. Sometimes I think there's a struggle that one can have who's in a leadership position from being a person who's like, this is how we do it. And look what I've done. Right. So how do we, how is there, is there anything that you, I don't know, on a practical level, is there a way to properly do that? as Paul is doing here? I mean, obviously the, the best answer is that, that relationship that mm-hmm. we, um, something that's, that's missing, um, in education and something that's missing in, um, professional, the professional world as well is that apprenticeship and mentorship that is, is, so present and so visible in the life of the early church. Mm. Um, and we get to a point where we, you know, my focus is obviously within, within the church, but I think this is also true of other institutions as well, where we institutionalize things, right? The, tran- the transfer of knowledge becomes the, the responsibility of the institution. And so you then have a relationship to the institution as opposed to the one who is actively imparting the knowledge. It's the institution who imparts the knowledge, not the people within the institution. Um, Mm. And that's, I think that's true of many educational systems. That's true of a lot of work, right? Like people come in, if there's any continuing growth and, and development, it's not provided, you know, it's, it's very rarely provided uh, in a mentorship approach, but yet that seems to be the best and only way to make strong and effective lifelong growth. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have spiritual fathers. That's why we have spiritual brothers and and sisters and mothers, right? That's why we have these relationships. So to your point of the difference between boasting and holding yourself up as an example or using your own experiences, is that Timothy can, Timothy knows these things, right? Timothy has seen these things. Timothy was there for some of these things. So when St. Paul, you know, reminds Timothy of what befell him at Antioch, Timothy doesn't have to, you know, like imagine what that's like. He knows because he knows St. Paul. And even if he wasn't there, like I'm sure St. Paul physically bore the scars of being stoned at Lisa, like, there's, there's no way that he wasn't bearing the, the marks of that. So if you know him and you spend time with him, then you'll actually see the, the, the results of these things. So when you appeal to them, it's not something that you're not connected to. Right. And, and he's, he, in doing so, is not really focusing on himself, but how the knowledge of these things can benefit Timothy. Right. That's, I mean, that's really, I think where his focus is, is not like, right. it, it, this is this, 
everything you've seen. And this is why we have the saints, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I, I always ponder there, you know, at the fact that other Christian denominations don't have saints, they miss out on, on these examples mm-hmm. that there's something to be gained on our behalf when we read this too here now as, yeah. as a, uh, yeah, and St. Paul's yeah. focus is is on using his experiences for Timothy and our own benefit, right? The, the point is mm-hmm. when he says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is, that's about us, right? He's telling Timothy, you know, should you desire to live a godly life, this is what will befall you, right? He's not telling, he's not telling Timothy these things that happened to him for so that Timothy can marvel at what a godly life St. Paul has lived, but he is preparing him for what living a godly life in his own right will look like. Yeah. And, and he's passing on the, you know, the same stuff that Jesus told his disciples, mm-hmm. right? What is it? John 15 or something is like the no servant is greater than his master. Yeah. You know, if they did this to me, they're going to do even more to you. I mean, like Christ himself is not making some sort of guarantee of comfort or security. Mm -hmm. Um, And and, and that's one of the, you know, the, our, our initiation into the gospel, into the way of the church is always like through these people, through these guides, like you were saying, Father Panayote. And Mm -hmm. it's, if, if, if they are authentic, if they are true, they are simply going to be passing on what they themselves has received. And here is Paul just kind of passing on what he received, Christ doesn't make any illusions about the struggle that's going to lay ahead. Paul is not making any illusions that about the struggle that's going to lay ahead. And, and all of us in not to that level of persecution, right. But here at the beginning of the Triodion period, have a struggle ahead of us. It's, it's not going to be easy. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's an important, that's an important point to, to bring up Steve, that this, this persecution will come both from, both from, the worldly people and things, but also from, from spiritual realities as well. Right. Like we can often say like, I, well, I live in the United States. Like I'm not, how much persecution am I actually going to face personally? Right. Because we've, we've talked, I don't want to read, I don't want to, you know, go down the road again. Right. But Starbucks cup is not a, is not a persecution. Right. Right. So the reality is that for many, for many of us, we probably will not face, right? And we will not face real persecution. Anyway, from the state, from, you know, uh, others and whatnot. But that does not mean like that the devil's not going to attack us, right? And harder, right. the closer we get to to the Lord, right? Once we live a more and more godly life, the, the devil will try harder and harder to, to pull us away from that path to pull us away from, from God and to um, attempt to reinsert himself within a life that has been filled with godliness. Hmm. Yeah. Right. We can be so focused. Sometimes we can be so focused on the, the perceived persecution from outside that we miss the spiritual persecution and attacks that are being waged against us. And oftentimes one of the best ways to for the for the devil to attack us is to implant those false feelings of persecution right Mm. which can lead to a sense of um justification right i'm being persecuted because i'm good or yeah i mean it's a whole host right it could be pride it could be could be you know like well this exactly like i'm i'm receiving this this is hard because of how how godly my life is which i don't know anybody who says that but um (laughs) right um but also even a sense of victimization right like we can Mm -hmm. the the devil can attack us can persecute us by convincing us that we are in fact victims when we are not yeah and we've 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 touched a little bit about that rhythm right like that's one of the dangers of allowing the 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 world so to speak to kind of be our compass right like when we we say like you know the world is treating me in this way therefore as opposed to what paul is telling timothy later on like you know the scripture you know what you've seen in me like that Mm -hmm. becomes your frame of reference rather than a response to something that you're hearing from outside 
That's interesting too. Now I, I, and I'm reading this and I'm thinking about, okay, so if you're living a Christian life, you will be persecuted one way or another. Mm-hmm. And when I read this, I've, I have, I've often had this thought and Chris system calls it out um, mm-hmm. where Christ says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Mm-hmm. And yet, wait a minute. If God, if Christ is telling us that that's the case, then why are we being persecuted? That doesn't sound like a very light load at all. It sounds like the opposite. Like we're running into the persecution almost. Um, and that burden is not light at all. Um, but he goes on to say that it's, Every, everyone has some sort of struggle, right? Everyone has certain struggles. And some of the struggles we receive will be as a result of being Christian, but also being tied to Christ. This burden is lighter than if we weren't. There's a joy in which we receive these, these struggles that we, we, can, we can work through these struggles. There's a joy that we can have within, within the struggle that is offered to us because of our love and knowledge of our savior, our resurrected Christ. Right. Right. Yeah. So he doesn't, he doesn't, it's, it's an important point, right? He doesn't say uh, going with that, that uh, quote from Christ himself. He doesn't say that, you know, come to me and you will have no burden. Right. right? Like he, he talks about the, the burden being lessened. But it doesn't take away the the quote unquote the burden in in of itself, and that yeah. is because with 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 Christ he bears he bears us and he bears our burdens on his own on his own shoulders. Um, so it is it is help it is an aid in affliction as opposed to like just wiping everything away. Yeah. So you're saying when there was one set of footprints in the sand. It was the same. Thing. Anywho, uh, the same, but, the same people walk single file. That's right. Precise, yeah, <laughs> but 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 I mean, Chrysostom himself, right, is 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 an example of this. That um, he was he was marched to death, mm-hmm. right, by the emperor, and and mm-hmm. his last words were very famously like, "Glory to God for all things." Right. His last words were not of complaints. His last words were not of um, I don't know, judgment or finger pointing or whatever it is. When we sometimes use the world as our frame of reference and and push back that the spirit of victimization, the spirit of resentment, whatever it might be. It's like, okay, here I am. Glory to God for all things as his body finally gives way to what was it? Months or weeks of, of incredibly harsh treatment for the third time. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and, and again, it's, I think it's, it's helpful for us to, to think about at the beginning of this, this Lenten struggle too, because we do have, we do have a road ahead of us. We've got the, 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 the weeks that are leading up into the Lent and then Lent and, you know, this, the, the, the ascetic struggle of, of, of praying more and fasting more and almsgiving more and all the other sort of stuff, which is a, a freely entered into struggle, um, mm-hmm. which if we're not careful can lead into some of those same that same temptation to pride, that same temptation to victimization, that same temptation to, you know, whatever. Um, so it's kind of a, a good sort of ground, ground grounded thing. Like ob- observe those who have endured, observe those who have run the race, observe the way that even in the midst of all of this, they gave glory to God and had joy despite having empty stomachs and empty pockets and an extra crick in their back from all of the, <laughs> from all of the whatever. Mm-hmm. yeah um can we mm-hmm. can we shift topics for sure. a second unless you wanted father nick do you have a, a closing on this one no 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 go ahead okay. i wanted to focus on the end and i know i'm the chief of like sticking to the you know original intent of uh, St. Paul as he, as he writes, but I want to take, see how the church, one of the ways in which the church uses this, uh, this writing, uh, since it is tied to the beginning of the Triodion period. Um, and this might be a bit of a stretch, but I think it's an important point to make whether it's, you know, whether it can be pinpointed to this particular passage or, or not, but as, as St. Paul concludes, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, 
knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I wanted to focus on his expectation that Timothy would be acquainted with the scriptures from his, from his childhood. And then focus on how um, the church uses the scriptures to instruct us for our salvation through faith in, in Christ Jesus. So the first point is that St. Paul has an expectation that Timothy has grown up from childhood with the scriptures, right? And, and the point being, this is not, you know, for many of the people that St. Paul is, is missionizing, for many of the people that he's introducing to Christ, they are pagans and they have not come from a, a background where they have any connection with God, the father, his son, or the Holy spirit prior to St. Paul coming. Um, they don't have the scriptures. So he needs to like, you know, the Athenians, he has to put it in, in terms that they understand. And, um, you know, at other, at other points, you know, they, they, they think that he is, uh, uh, an Olympian God, right? The point being, they don't have that same basis, but Timothy does. And this is, this is such an important part of kind of what we were speaking about earlier at the beginning, when we were talking about mentorship and handing things, things down. If you go back, um, to, to Deuteronomy, when God is giving the people their commandments, um, he says to them, you know, you shall, this is Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, one of the you know, most famous lines from, from the book of Deuteronomy, and you shall teach them. He's talking about the commandments. Now, um, these, the words that they've received, uh, he says, you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and walk by the way, when you lie down and when you raise up, this is the kind of the tail end of that Shema, um, prayer that was so is so foundational within, within, um, the life of the Israelites, but, you know, the community had a responsibility to hand down and teach the story of the Exodus, the story of, of God establishing his covenant with his people and the details and precepts of the covenant so that they would be well-educated. And as they got older, could live according to those commandments. Like God, God had an expectation that this community would live according to the commandments that he handed down to them. Therefore it was part of being an active member of the community to know those things and to live accordingly. And to that point, he, he tells them like, you should tell these things to your children. Even when you, when you sit down in your house, when you, when you walk by the way, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, we talked about institutionalizing education, uh, you know, there, there's a, there can be an expectation that religious education is the purview of the institution of the church in terms of our programs. It's, that's yeah. not, that's it's outsourced not, to them. It's, it's outsourced, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of, well, and again, this is not to put down youth groups or Sunday school or religious education or Bible study, but when God is establishing his covenant with his people, the model that he expects them to, to use, right? He doesn't talk, talk to them about, you know, like establishing schools. It doesn't, you know, places of education and schools existed, but it's not like they didn't, but it was to take place in every home, yeah. right? And it was to take place around your table. And it was to take place when you walked, you know, from here to there, when you were doing your work, right? It, there wasn't a, a ministry of, education. It was to be a part of your life. And the responsibility of a parent was to teach the precepts of God to their children. Yeah. Yeah. Because parents pass on more than their genes, right? Parents pass on their, their inclination and, and, and what they value and what they don't value. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, this is a constant that you see in the lives of the saints. Like even you go to the, the 20th century saints, uh, the formative moment in their lives tends not to be kind of a programmatic institutional experience, but it's waking up in the middle of the night and, and, and seeing mom or dad like prostrating before the icon, or it's, mm -hmm. you know, walking out to the, the, you know, the little village chapel for the feast and sort of like lighting the candles and so forth. Right. Like these genuine moments of like piety and care that are passed mm -hmm. down from generation to generation. 
um, yeah. as God himself is saying, right? Like if this matters, like teach your kids. Yeah. And I think one of the benefits I'll say just from what I've, what I've witnessed in programmatic approaches to, you know, transferring the faith from one generation to the next is less the effectiveness of the programs themselves and more the fact that they establish relationships that can develop into these type of authentic mentor relationships, right? Like yeah. no, no child is going to be saved by a week worth of a week's worth of camp, but the relationships that are established at a camp that then translate into a lifelong friendship where you can rely on one another, right? So we're, I'm not, I'm not throwing programs under the bus saying we don't need programs, but to expect that the program will do everything that it's intended to do is, is misplaced. It is when we take an active interest in passing on what we've received to another over a long period of time that we then see the strength that St. Paul can rely on by saying, you've, you've known this, you've learned this from your childhood. It's firm. Fall back on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have an obligation then to, to, to do that, to, to make sure that as we sit down at table, as we're walking, that we're having, that we're speaking to our friends, our children, our family, others in our life about the precepts of God. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a, there's a point of connection between the stuff about persecution and, and that, because I think, you know, this maybe is more of a psychological point that in times of difficulty, we tend to fall back on pre-existing old habits, right? Like in times of difficulty, you sort of like, you just revert back to the things that you already know. And I think, I think there's, there's something kind of like very psychologically and spiritually wise about this, that this is opening up with the difficulties and the challenges. And Paul is reminding Timothy, like, you know, this already, right? This isn't new for you. Like, you're not going to, you're not going to develop an appreciation for scripture in the midst of persecution. <laughs> Most likely you're going to fall back on your old habits, right? Like, like change is hard, right? And when like, we, so know, what when habits people... are you having, right? Yeah. That, I mean, right. So what habits do you have when things are, are, are good or aren't, you aren't being persecuted. That's a real important uh, part. And I think as we lead into now the trio into, into Lent and, and creating, you know, work, like it's, it's a call for a specific time where it's like, work on these habits, work on our spirituality. This is, you know, if you're not already doing it, let's go. And, uh, and so that, like you're saying, when things get tough and you are persecuted, you fall into the, uh, like the habits that you have that are good. Good point, Steve. Yeah. You fall back on the scripture because it's in your bones, right? You fall back on a, on prayer life because it's, 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 it's in your bones. I mean, granted difficulty in the, difficulties in our life can provoke a change, but I mean, I look at me, like when I feel stressed or when I feel overwhelmed, like I tend to default to old TV shows or favorite snacks or whatever it is. Right. I mean, like you, those are the sort of like the, the, the wagon wheels, like the ruts in your mind. And, and those are just kind of like, the synapses that are stronger. And so you default to that um, as opposed to what it would have turned to the scripture it was as much of an instinctual sort of thing, because you've been doing it from the time for as long as you can remember. Right. Right. So then the second point is given that this is being written by St. Paul, obviously clearly during his lifetime, what scriptures is he talking about? Ah. Are you talking about being acquainted with the sacred writings or the scriptures? It's the same thing. It's His own like letters. It's not like <laughs> this is not St. Paul being like, hey. Right. Make sure you, you know, collect your my letters from the Thess Yeah, get, get my letters from the Thessalonians and, mm -hmm. uh, and the Corinthians and put them all together. Right. Right. That was not so the, the case. Point, yeah, right. The point he's making is the, these sacred writings are the Old Testament. Right. Right. And I think that's really important. That's, that's an important part of, uh, that's an important part of Triodion. You know, our, our show focuses primarily on Sundays, but once we get into, um, once we get into the fasting portion of Triodion and even, even before then, um, 
our readings shift from epistle and gospel readings on a daily basis, at least on the weekdays, to Old Testament readings during those days that we don't celebrate the divine liturgy. So here we are at the beginning of Triodion, and we conclude the first epistle apostolic reading of Triodion, reminding us that we've been acquainted with the scriptures, or we should have been, right? Timothy was, we should be from our youth, because those will instruct us for salvation. And then the church goes, and over the next couple of weeks, goes back and says, okay, here are, here are the scriptures. St. Paul was referencing the sacred writings. You know, he wasn't referencing himself. He was referencing the, the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and so we replace these New Testament readings on a daily basis with Old Testament readings, right? One from each portion of the, the Old Testament. Um, the Torah, we read from Genesis, we read from Proverbs, and we read from Isaiah. Mm. And these three, these three books, right? That's it. The, the Old Testament is 48 books, right? But we only choose three, not because it's just so massive, you couldn't get through it in, in, you know, six weeks. But the point being that, as St. Paul says, these, these three books are instructive for our salvation. Once we get into Holy Week, then we add Exodus, um, which is also very important. Um, but the point being, Genesis helps establish, for lack of a better word, like establish the problem, mm. right? This is, Genesis introduces us to our need for salvation. It, it shows us our creation and what was, what the Lord intends in the garden, and then shows our great fall away from that. And Genesis ends with that, you know, kind of promise to Abraham and his descendants that they will enter into the, the promised land. And we pick that theme up in Exodus when we get into Holy Week, which is, you know, the, the precursor foretaste of that. So we read Genesis for our instruction so that we can see and identify the need that we have as human beings for the salvation that God promises. We have Isaiah, which is referred to by many of the fathers as, you know, like, affectionately called the fifth gospel um, because the the prophecies are so rich in Isaiah um, the salvation that is promised to us is so present within um, the prophetic visions and words that he's received from God that um, you know almost Isaiah alone is enough to, to give us the entirety of the gospel um, from from the Old Testament so Genesis tells us this is what this is what your need is isaiah shows us how that need is going to be met by god mm -hmm. and then proverbs is in light of the you know in light of your need and in preparation for the fulfillment of that need here is how you live right and so proverbs becomes the practical application of our response to our sinfulness in preparation for the salvation that the Lord brings, right? So when St. Paul says that these sacred writings instruct us for salvation, the church then responds by saying, here, here's the Old Testament, at least three books of it for yeah. your instruction, so that when we sing the Paschal hymns of Christ's resurrection and our, you know, our victory over death through him, you'll understand why. You'll yeah you'll be instructed and ready to receive that. You'll know what you were delivered from. You'll know who delivered you and you'll know how know. to respond to that deliverance with a holy life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's beautifully said. That's beautifully said. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> yeah. So read your Genesis, your Isaiah, and your Proverbs. And and as you go, if you have a and if you have a, a Triodion book at home, right? Because again, these hymns are sort of like what if you don't packaged? I mean, you'll 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 see that connectivity, right? Because there's the it's called, the, it's called Google. Okay, I'm, I'm serious, right? No, I'm serious. Yeah. If you don't have that at home, because I'm guessing the majority of people don't think oh, I'm going to get the Triodion and purchase it. Maybe they should, but if you don't, can you find it online? 
I'm sure you can. I was just uh, in preparation for this. I, I was looking up, I, I found a, a link that had all of the readings for every day of Lent, right? With links mm -hmm. to each of the passages. Okay. I don't remember where, but I mean, right. you can find anything online anymore. Today. Internet's a big place, yeah. It is. Plus, I, I mean, there's your standard, like the, the, the GOA website, the OCA website, I'm assuming the Antiochian website, right? These, the churches post the, the readings, readings for right. the day, right? So if you, if you do want to save yourself that, save yourself the Google search, you can go to any of the canonical Orthodox jurisdictions, and I'm sure they will have their, the readings for you. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Mm -hmm. And away we go. That's right. That's right. I was thinking about it as a first time priest my, in my rookie season. Long time Christian, oh. first time priest. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm in my rookie season right now. And I'm just thinking about how excited and terrified I am for the upcoming uh, London season. And it's good a good place to be right a bit of a bit of hopeful expectation a bit of ooh. yeah yeah i think so cool. i have nothing to add i'm i'm, I'm there's really no no i have nothing to add to this conversation how about, how about you point. add how about you add your prayerful words and right. uh, conclude us for today okay in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit now and forever into the ages of ages amen, amen. christ our god Watch over us this Lenten season and Shrodion as we begin this journey towards Pascha. Strengthen us and guide our steps that we may take all the things that we have learned from childhood until now and the things that we are learning along the way and that we may act to the glory of you with the hope of what is to come in the resurrection at the end of this journey. For you are holy always, now and forever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. So... We're going to be off for the next two weeks because I'm going to be in Los Angeles and then Allen, Texas. Um, if you're in the OCA Diocese of the South, maybe I'll see you in two weeks. I'm doing some effective Christian ministry training for the clergy down there. But we'll be back. It'll be Lent, I guess, by that point, right? Sure. Anyway, the, ne the next two weeks off, so. Three men in a Bible exploring the Sunday scriptures. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.